Thank you for coming. And please fasten your seat belts because I think this is going to be a lively one. Um, I'm Tom Ricks. I'm not going to go through with reading aloud the biographies of the panel because I believe that if you're here, you probably know how to read. And you can figure out who these people are by looking in your program. So we're going to kick it right off. And I threw out the entire plan for this panel after dinner last night uh, because at the dinner, Nur Rosen, Nur, are you here somewhere? Well, I hope he shows up. Nur Rosen said to me, I believe that the coverage of the war in Syria has been the worst we've had of any modern war, much worse than Iraq or Afghanistan. And it isn't getting any better, it's getting worse. So we're going to kick the panel off by asking someone who's in the middle of covering this, is Nur Rosen right in saying this is the worst covered war in modern memory? We're going to start now with Abdulaziz Al Hamza. Oh, I'm, you're right. I forgot the stinking poll. <laughs> oh, I can't hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> I was supposed, I, I made a note of it. Uh, I was told yesterday that we're supposed to do the poll questions, and the, and the boss just reminded me. Um, in 10 years, where do you think our, most of our war reporting will come from? A, reporters with independent media organizations. B, reporters with state-sponsored media organizations. C, individuals with personal technology and social media. Or D, combatants with blogs or other direct outlets. You may fire when ready. Well, there you go. You, you guys all just get fired. The panel's over. <laughs> OK. Abdul Aziz? Yes, she's right first. Uh, if we want to talk about the war in Syria, when the Syrian revolution started in March 2011, the first step what the Syrian regime did that he didn't let the media organization, the international media organization, to enter the country and cover the revolution there even they kicked out most of the media organization who were working there. So they tried to not show what's going on in the city. And that's the things what for <coughs> the activists, the Syrian, to be a media man. So when I started to cover the war in Syria, I didn't study any journalism, any media, or anything. And most of the activists, so we didn't get any experience. But the situation there forced us to do all the things. We started to film by our own mobiles, so these dictator regimes, they don't want the media to be in their lands to show what's going on. So all that things forced us to do all that things, to cover, to report, to be activists, then citizen journalists. And right now there are a lot of Syrians who didn't study any media or any journalism. They are professional journalists or media men. They are doing a lot of shows. They are writing in international newspaper. So, that's what happened there, and uh, after, the, after that, uh, the extremism group started to be in Syria. And for this extremism group, they don't want, they don't want anyone to film or to report, only their own offices, their own media offices, because they want to spread their ideology. They don't want anyone to show the reality of them, the reality of the lives there. So they didn't let anyone, and if anyone was thinking to cover or to take a photo, they will be executed him directly. So it's not easy to work or to do anything. So photo on rocket will take you to the day. Now you've been interrogated by both the Syrian government and by ISIS, is that right? Yes. Um, in, the, in their interrogations, what do they say about media coverage of the war? Yes, they started to ask a lot if I take any, if I talk any photos, any videos, or anything. Uh, for them to to work as an activist before the Free Syrian Army, it was uh, n not a crime. More than that, so maybe they will kill you if you did that things. So for them, they were looking for the, uh, they are looking for the activists, the media men, the media centers, because before the Free Syrian Army, it. 
before the we was a say it was a, uh, a peaceful protest and they were looking for the activists the media center to shut down this revolution so they asked a lot and even they tortured me to say yes and i said yes because if uh, if I keep saying no, 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 they will be torturing me for 10, 15 days, whatever. And then they started to ask me, who's also working with you? So I didn't find anything only to say some names from my mind, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, they didn't tell me tell the names again because I not know how to say it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for ISIS, uh, Maybe you will not believe they were so cute with me. So they asked me to come three or four times to their main headquarters. And they started to ask me some questions. So you are an activist, a media man. So who are working with you in the media center? I told them, oh, they are friends we met before. And uh, uh, most of we met in the revolution and we were working in next name. So we don't know each other. And they started a lot, they tried a lot. They brought to me coffee, coke, whatever, crying. Okay, we will take you to cover some clashes. I thought, no, I'm fine, I don't want. They tried a lot. So for them, that wasn't the beginning. So they were not that power like right now. So they tried a lot and they started to ask me, okay, what about this guy? What about these guys? Uh, I heard that he went to Turkey and he's, the, there are some American, European, Western organization are training them. Is it right? Did they get any equipment, any laptops, or that things? So it was a crime to deal with any Western or European American organization. So for them, they tried a lot to shut down all these media centers, any act, uh, any activity inside the city. Okay. Uh, Vivian Salama has the unique qualification <coughs> of being the only person in the world who went from covering the war in Iraq to the American presidential campaign, what we call from the frying pan into the Trump. Uh, Vivian, your perspective, was, has the war in Syria and more broadly, the fighting generally across the Middle East, has the coverage deteriorated notably? And is it actually bad coverage of wars now? I, I wouldn't call it the worst coverage. Um, and I, you know, we were speaking about this earlier, I would definitely call it the hardest war to cover um, just based on accessibility, but I mean, there are some really brilliant people um, that have covered Syria. There are very brave people covering Syria, some of them in the audience here. Um, and so, you know, a tremendous respect to them. Uh, also, I, you know, for me, the most important thing that I want everyone to remember every single day is the sacrifice that the locals are making. So people like Abdelaziz, but also some of our staffers. You know, we have news organizations, we as a major news organizations, we rely so much on locals. They make a huge sacrifice. I can leave Iraq, a lot of them can't. I, you know, people can leave Syria, others cannot. And so those people every single day are making a sacrifice to report on the news and they are taking a tremendous risk every single day to do that. And so they do a very, very good job, but unfortunately they are, they have a lot of uh, limitations. You know, Abdelaziz was just talking about one of his confrontations um, with the militants and you know, that's a reality every single day. And so that is also one of the reasons that it becomes very, very challenging, but definitely, you know, these people know what they're talking about and they, they do do a tremendous effort to do that and to bring us the news every day. Um, I mean, there's definitely an issue that's taking place right now as far as how we get the news from some of these militant held areas. And you know, for me, I, I you know, my, my strength wasn't really Syria as much as Iraq, but um, you know, it's the same situation in Iraq where you have a third, maybe a little bit less now, but a third of the country basically in militant hands and uh, anyone who has gone into that territory, you know, takes a basically a huge risk of not coming back. And so we have to rely a lot of times on locals um, that are there and who are basically working, uh, you know, uh, anonymously to to help us understand what's happening. Uh, in the beginning, we used to have to deal with uh, making phone calls all the time to militant held territory, but then that got very, very difficult because they shut down the phone signals, they shut down the internet in some areas, and so we started to even not be able to reach people. Not to mention the fact that people became too afraid to talk. 
Um, and so, you know, all of these things in general obviously complicate matters, but at the end of the day, you know, there are still people who, um, who have taken the risk, who do go into these areas, um, who do have the contacts both with um, locals, uh, just residents living there, civilians, and also with the militants even, that they're able to kind of gather information and make some informed uh, reporting, do some informed reporting based on that. And so, when that's basically just my two cents on it is that, you know, there is some very smart reporting out there. You obviously have to pick and choose, you know, fact from fiction sometimes because unfortunately it's very hard to determine when you can't physically be there. So. Okay. Um, the Army Chief of Staff uh, referred to Harvard this morning as the number two institution. I was pleased because, of course, I went to the number one, um, which is Yale. Uh, um, I assume he, ref he went to number three. Um, here we have someone from Harvard who's going to explain it all. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure that Syria is the worst covered war currently. I think Yemen is because it's not being covered. Um, and that to me is as much of an issue. Um, it's not just the number of journalists there, or, but how we allow sort of the dictates of what's going on in U.S. policy determine in journalism what we cover. So where is the coverage of the war in Yemen? It's certainly not because we don't have U.S. involvement there. It's not because of casualties. It's not because of the potential implications. Um, so it goes beyond Syria. I guess you could say every war is the worst covered, but it's also where we're covering and how we determine what the coverage is. And finally, to a serving U.S. Army officer, Joe Brierley, a proud scout, uh, which is what they call cab guys, I guess. And um, I want you to answer the question in this context. Is the coverage bad because no one cares, at least in this country, anymore? What happens to war coverage when the American people don't give a damn? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Tom. I, I think whenever you have a large investment in something, uh, you're really interested in that investment. And there's, you know, myself and a lot of my serving uh, brothers and sisters are not over there. And so I think right now, because of that, the American people aren't that interested in, what, unfortunately, uh, what's going on in Syria. And I think a lot of that drives the coverage of the war. Um, are the microphone people up and running? Okay, I just want to make sure we, we have the mics available. At this point, I don't want to go to questions, but I do want to offer the chance. If I know there are some reporters here who have covered the war in Syria and covered it pretty damn well. Uh, I, this is a chance for you guys to jump in here. Uh, are you a Syria war person? Okay, hold on one second. Mics are traveling in your direction. And also, is Nur, did Nur ever show up? And I know we have at least one other Syria war reporter here. If you're here and you want to speak, fire away. Okay? Uh, okay. I actually just wanted to ask Please a stand up and ID yourself. Hi, I'm Janine DiGiovanni. I'm the Middle East editor of Newsweek. Um, and I actually just wanted to ask a question of Vivian and Aziz. I've also written a book about Syria, and I've been covering war for more than 25 years. So for me, Syria is the most difficult war to cover. Um, and thank you for mentioning Yemen. I think you're absolutely right. I, I just got a visa to Yemen. Um, but really what I want to ask you is how do we keep reporting this, and how do we use local reporters? How do we combine it if we can't actually do the field work? Because in places like Bosnia, Chechnya, or Somalia, where I've worked before, we could, it was always dangerous. It's never not been dangerous, but we could just rock up to a front line or to a commander or in bed with rebel forces in Sierra Leone or Liberia. We, it's, we can do that in Syria, but it's much harder. So I'd like to ask, especially Vivian, who, who was the bureau chief in Iraq, how could we use local reporters and incorporate it with our own work and make sure we're still doing fair and objective reporting. Thank you. And I'd like to hear you too. Okay. So you, you too? Okay. Go for it. Okay. Uh, last one. Okay, so first if we want to talk about the local. Uh, so to let the local walk is not easy. So as I mentioned first time, if you will take a photo on Raqqa, it will take you to the death. So even a normal photo for yourself, not to the media or to, not to anyone, 
the ISIS bread allows checkpoints to check their mobile phones, laptops, whatever. So even it's not easy to the local to walk or to cover or to do some anything. But for sure, it's easier than a foreign one. Because in Syria, after five years of the war, there are a lot of extremism groups, a lot of uh, army groups, and the foreign, it's, for them, the foreign it means a big amount of money. So if any foreigner reporters will go there, they will arrest him asking for money, because most of these groups are looking for money. And they know that this reporter, that we will ask his government to pay million dollar or whatever to release him. So it's not easy to any reporter to go there. Spe uh, especially these days because it started to be so complicated. And even for the local, there are a lot of activists have been arrested by several groups, so it's not easy even to them to walk. So first, in the first two years of the Syrian revolution, it was so easy to walk in the libera liberated area. So if there is any liberated area, areas under free Syrian control, it's so easy and there were a lot of reporters, they came to Alibo countryside, to Homos, to these cities to, co to cover the war there. So it, uh, right now to let this local work is not easy because the internet connection is really so bad and uh, it's different from a city to another and it depends which groups are controlling the city. So if we want to talk about Raqqa, there are only four internet coffee shops. These four internet coffee shops are controlled by ISIS, and it's not allowed to any civilian to have his own internet in his house. And ISIS started to get a car with kind of radar to, to monitor the signals. So if there is any Wi-Fi router or if there is any satellite net. So there is no mobile networks. There is n it's so hard to get access to internet or to transfer information or to do anything. So they tried a lot. In the same time, they bred cameras all over the city to catch anyone who's, who was trying or taking to take these photos. It's the same, not the same, less than that in the Syrian regime areas. They are doing the same, so they have a lot of jails. A lot of Syrians enter these jails and they get out killed. So it's not easy, but uh, there is a way in some areas, some cities, to let this local work. But the, there are a lot of problems. Most, most of them, they can't speak English, so they should do it in Arabic than to find translator. And some of them that, let's say, some of them, they have their own ideology. So they will report from what he wanted to report. So if he, if he has an Islamic ideology, so he will not report against Islamic group. So, and if he is uh, with the Free Syrian army, so he will not report anything against the Free Syrian army. So it's so complicated to fight independent uh, local journalists. How many of your friends and colleagues have been killed fighting or covering the war in Syria? So in our group, uh, four of our friends have been killed and six, they are family members, some friends are linked to us. Um, thanks for the question, Jean. So, I mean, you, you have these situations where you have to consider um, the safety of your staff, obviously. Um, you know, that is always a priority for us, definitely at the AP, but I know other news organizations as well. Um, you know, and I would always, because I was the bureau chief and I had to sort of give, make the call of, as far as safety and everything like that, you know, my take was always, it's not worth it, get out. You know, and we had situations where, you know, we had reporters in militant held cities who there was just a slight suspicion, there was a rumor that they might be working for a news organization that may not be Arab. And based on that, people started talking, they felt like they had to get out, but some of them just want to get paid. They, they, they're afraid that if they flee, they're not going to get paid, their families are not going to be able to eat. And it's already so hard to get any kind of cash flow going in these cities, you know, the economy is virtually stopped in places like Mosul and whatever, and so it becomes really difficult. And so you have these situations. It's also hugely unpredictable where they want to flee, but now it's really difficult because you have to put your house up for collateral if you try to flee um, a lot of these militant-held cities, and so they're afraid they're going to lose their houses, and so they're just tor they're completely torn between how do you get out and how do you stay, how do you report the news, and how do you keep your family safe. Um, we had a situation where one of our reporters in a militant health city tried to escape and, you know, again, it's totally unpredictable. So he tried to escape to take his family to Kirkuk where it's safe. 
Um, he got stopped at a checkpoint. The guy started to have suspicions about him. It turned into a really ugly debate. And you know, he calls me up from the from the road and he says, "Oh, well, I got out." And I said, "Well, how'd you do it?" He goes, "Well, I almost got killed." I said, "Well, well, but what what happened?" And he says, "Well, you know, the the guy stopped me at the checkpoint. He started yelling at me. He started pushing at me. And in the middle of the fight, where I thought, okay, it's over. He's going to execute me because he thinks that I'm fleeing something, and he got suspicious. He's like, I, I smelled cigarettes on his breath, and I'm like, cigarettes." but it's banned in Milton Hell territory. And he goes, ha, ha, ha. So he goes to the back of his car and he pulls out a pack, of, a pack of cigarettes that he got from a smuggler. He took a huge risk. He could have gotten his hands chopped off. I mean, that's supposedly the rule. Gives the guy the pack of cigarettes, he lets him go. And so, you know, these guys, they know how to operate much better than any of us would, but they're also taking a huge risk. And so he did manage to get out, but that's one case. We have a lot of situations where they're not so fortunate. And so you have to just, I mean, we tried to pull out a lot of our reporters early on in the process um, just to, but a lot of them chose to stay. They chose to stay to defend their cities. They chose to stay to report on what's happening on their cities, to make money to, for their families. Some of them have evacuated their families, but they stay. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's really, there's no rule for it. We're just trying to. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And I mean, what she said was, it's really a, the moral dilemma of how do you protect your people. But another problem that I saw for managers, newsroom managers in Iraq, was to have an effective staff, you had to have both people op comfortable operating in Shiite areas and Sunni areas. That meant you had Shia and Sunnis, young men generally, sitting side by side, working together. I remember our, when I was at the Washington Post, our bureau chief, Rajiv, ended up putting up a sign in our Baghdad newsroom, no sectarian t-shirts allowed. <laughs> I mean, this is people, you couldn't come in having, you know, your, your Mokhtar t-shirt on that day and stuff like that. But the U Iraqi staff did unite against the American staff. Yes, smoking is allowed. <laughs> um, and boy, do they smoke. I want to go to you two at the end here because we're getting into the question of narrative and who controls it. Everybody in the military discovered the word narrative the last few years. You've got to control the narrative, battle for the narrative. Well, we're actually the people who write narrative for a living. Does that mean that journalists are now participants in the battlefield to be worked on, manipulated, and some organizations believe killed if necessary? Joe, Sharon? Well, I don't think journalists control the narrative, or if we do, we're not doing a very good job. We're in an election cycle where the narrative is refugees, and that is guiding the narrative. It's guiding the narrative on the wars and how we're reporting on them. Um, so I, I, I wish I had a better answer. I don't know how journalists can somehow take control of the narrative or push it in a different direction. I wish I did. Um, maybe you have a better answer. No, I don't. And I, and I agree with you. I, I don't think you can control the na narrative. You can just contribute to it, and that's why um, you know I, I saw on the uh, the survey that we took that 10% uh, of the folks in here think that reporting will come from those on the ground. <clears throat> and last year, it, it's it's crazy that I'm sitting up here with you, all of you, in a suit because last year I was on leave and I was watching this conference in pajama pants, uh, <laughs> eating a bowl of Cheerios. And uh, one one of the things that happened, la some of the comments that were made last year, critiques. Uh, about the military was, uh, was our failure to think strategically, our failure to, uh, to adapt, and our failure to work with uh, civilian leadership. And our voice was absent from that. Our voice was absent from that narrative. And so uh, shortly after that, uh, I connected with folks uh, through Twitter and the Military Writers Guild. And, and within five days, uh, we had put together and mobilized a group of writers from the, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, the Marine Corps, even our friends uh, over in the Australian Defense Force, and uh, through a, a great publication, the Strategy Bridge, had a professional discussion about preparing leaders for the future of war. And the folks that participated in that conversation were the uh, junior to mid-grade officers and NCOs, people that will be senior leaders. So I don't think you control the narrative, but I think it's important that uh, from a military standpoint that we participate in the narrative. But if the narrative goes in a direction the military doesn't like, how does the military change that narrative? I, I, I don't think we can. The narrative's based off of actions, it's based off reality, and it's based off the interpretation of events. And like Sharon said, those are things that you cannot, you cannot control. 
What other trends do you foresee, you group of four people with very different perspectives, see out there that will shape the future of war coverage? Will it all be social media tweeting back and forth? For me, yes. So right now, the social media that are doing the most of the work. If we want to talk about Syria, where I came from, so most of the international media organizations, they got their news from the activists, from the media center, because they can't go there. And some of them, they got it from a little bit. They got it from the Syrian regime local channels and from the Russian channels, because they are allowed to cover there. And the problem that the most of the news which, which are coming from the regime side or Russian media, it's not true. So, mm -hmm. and there are some international organization they got this news from the Russian and the Syrian regime. So it's a problem that all these wars, especially in the, Mili in the Middle East, so it's not easy to go and report because every reporter right now who are thinking to go there, he will think about his life because 90 or 80 percent he will be killed or kidnapped or whatever. So the social media will play the main role in the next uh, years, they say, in the war covering or war reporting. And the good thing that uh, right now, especially in the Middle East, there are a lot of citizen journalists who can do other things. And there is, for in, my, in my opinion, it's a good thing that if there is any Arab one, who can enter. So it's uh, like Vivian, she can speak Arabic. So it's easy to her to enter Syria because if she got any trouble, she will speak in Arabic and that's it. But if you can't speak Arabic, most of the people that they can't speak English. So you can't take yourself out from this problem. So for Arab reporters, it's uh, less hard than from the one who's, who can't speak Arabic. So, but that's is, the social media will play the mirror. My friend Anthony Shadid spoke Arabic and wound up dead on the Turkish-Syrian border. Are there any other Western reporters who stand out as having done a good job in Syria? Yes, there are. There are. There were some of them. They can enter in until 2012 or to first month of 2013, and after that they couldn't. So uh, I met some of them in Syria. There is. Uh, there is Bita who, two, I forgot their names, they are two French uh, journalists who came to Raqqa and they got arrested by ISIS and they released them. So they were so nice, uh, they, and I met, uh, I didn't meet, and I read some articles to some journalists who came to Alibu, count, uh, to Alibu countryside, they do a great job there. Uh, for us as a Syrian, when we started, we didn't think more than Arabic channels. Mm -hmm. So even we didn't think to report or to do or to deal with uh, international or uh, Western American media. So when I, when I was working in a media center in the first 2011, so we got an, a message on our, on our Facebook page, our media center face, uh, Facebook page, and we didn't think to reply or to answer mm -hmm. because we d for us, uh, only the Arabic channel. But after that, everything changed. We thought that the international media will change something, they will make some pressure on their governments, but nothing happened. Vivian, who are your go-to journalists of any sort, sources, right now and say over the last year for looking at Syria and the larger Middle East? Oh, one of them sitting in the audience, Rani mm -hmm. Abdesaid. So she's, she's a fantastic- Rani, if you want to talk, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think she. I actually think not because she's my friend, but that she's one of the best journalists on Syria. I think there are some really talented journalists. That's why I, I argued that it's not the worst covered; it's just hard to cover. Um, you know, I mean, Rania has taken great risk to to do the reporting that she's done, as have a couple of others. But um, I mean, it's it's not easy. It's not easy. And and the, you know, you were talking about trends earlier. If you ask me what the trends are, it's that there's no money in the business, and you have people who are freelancers who, uh, you know are struggling to find funding to do the work. Um, you know, sometimes have these phenomenal reports that they do, which they do on their own dime often, and they find it hard to sell because long form is not, uh, you know, as popular as it used to be. I mean, you know, it's hard to tell a really in-depth good story in 140 characters, and I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but, 
you know, and, and even people with staff jobs. Like, uh, you know, I, I've been a freelancer for a very long time, and I finally got a staff job. And then you have budget constraints at, at, yeah. at larger news organizations. And so um, that impacts security, it impacts your ability to just turn out stories. And unfortunately, you know, when you have budget constraints, you can't be in the places you want to be in. And a lot of times, you end up being forced to write these stories on the phone. And I'm sorry, but no matter how good of a journalist you are, you can tell a story that's been written through phone calls versus a story that's been reported in person. And so that is obviously changing the nature of how we report these stories. But there still are, I argue, still very good journalists who are covering these wars. Um, maybe they're getting fewer and fewer. And so maybe you call that being the worst covered war. But I, I, I just, you know, it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a symptom of what the business is going through too. Ronnie, did you want to jump in here? Okay, Mike, microphone to Ronnie. If you stand up, they'll see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ronnie Abuzaid, and I've been covering Syria since 2011, as well as uh, Iraq and other places in the Middle East for about a decade before that. God knows I'd never speak for Nir Rosen because, you know, he can speak for himself. But I think that what he um, meant, and it's something that we've discussed, is um, perhaps the over-reliance on social media in a, in a very difficult um, conflict where um, it's, it's life-threatening to cover Syria. Um, you know, social media is only ever a snippet. It's a very short moment in time, and um, we need to view it like that, and there might be a bit of an over-reliance on it. We have to understand what came before and what comes after it. And we also have to understand that um, social media is, for the most part, something that somebody wants us to see. And our role as journalists is to cover everything else. So, um, you know, with, with regard to Syria, we're seeing a lot of that. We're also um, taking things from activists who, with my deepest respect, are activists who have an agenda as well. So all of these things have to be considered when we look at um, covering Syria. And perhaps that is um, a, an element of what Nir meant when he says that it's um, you know, one of the worst. I wouldn't say it's one of the worst, but it, there are certainly questions um, in terms of how we do what we do. And uh, social media is key. As long as you have the mic in your hand, what trends worry you or, or see, do you see shaping war coverage right now and for the future? Retrenchment in, in the industry. I mean, you know, McClatchy has shuttered all of its foreign bureaus, for example, so the number of outlets that are um, taking our work is simply shrinking. And it's very dangerous when, um, you know, we're at a future of war conference. You want to talk about the future of war, well, it's our job to inform you about what's happening on the ground so that you can make informed decisions about the future of war and foreign policy. So um, from that perspective, in terms of information, it's terrifying that um, the number of outlets are shrinking. As Vivian said, uh, you know, the ability to do long form, to really explain the context, which is what Anthony Shadid used to do so well. It's not just about the event and what's happening, it's about what it means. And you know, you have to um, understand the place, you have to understand the language if you can, and not just the uh, be ling linguistically fluent, but also culturally fluent, historically fluent, mm -hmm. to understand the significance of what it is that you're seeing. It's funny, when you were talking about studying journalism, I thought, no, no, no. Don't study journalism. Study cultures and languages. That's the best tools a, a journalist in the field can have. Sharon, you're looking skeptical. Do you want to talk about trends, narrative, retrenchment? Well, actually, the people already made the point. You know, the people who thought a couple years ago that citizen journalists were going to replace traditional journalism it just hasn't come true. And there's more voices, there's more sources, but there's a larger and greater need um, for journalists, for professional journalists in the field, and that is a shrinking field. So, yeah, the, the predictions from a few years ago that we would have citizen journalists just hasn't been borne out. People still want context. Um, they still want the bigger picture. Okay, it's that time in the festivities when we go to questions. Uh, in this case, I think I'm willing to entertain also uh, responses, denunciations, and more comments from experienced people in the field. We have some wandering microphones. If you would hold up your hand, I see Lieutenant Colonel Bob Bateman ready to fire. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Bob Bateman, uh, New America now, uh, 25 years as an infantryman and strategist, and now with Esquire. So I kind of straddle the line. Um, so 100 years ago, journalism was a lot different. William Randolph Hearst tells his reporter in Cuba, you supply the story, I'll supply the war. And Pulitzer, feeling so guilty about 
his role in yellow journalism, which was at the time extremely biased, depending upon the outlook of the paper, um, felt so guilty that he founded uh, a prize that Tom knows about. So that was, that was only a little over 100 years ago. Uh, and now we've got a professional ethic within journalism about accountability, your sources, the concerns that Raina has, and we all have, about relying on social media and people with agendas and so forth. But the survey showed everybody thinks that in 10 or 20 years, most of the news is going to be coming from people with Twitter accounts or whatever the next big app is. So my question to all of you is, what are we going to do to, you know, the, they, they created the Columbia School of Journalism to create a profession of journalism and an ethic of journalism as it appears in the United States, not so much in England. You buy your newspaper there based upon your politics. Well, what do you think? Do we need to change journalism or do we need to educate the population about how to be more skeptical readers or a combination of both? I'm going to throw this open to the panel. Don't be shy. Oh, I feel like I've spoken too much, but oh, um, go ahead. Um, I I think journalism is in crisis. I mean, my friend just said it, and I say it again. I think I think that the business is having is suffering from an identity crisis at the moment. Uh, you have social media, which guides so much of what happens day to day in communications, day to day. Uh, but that's not sort of the type of information that we want to base our journalism on. Uh, it's it's what a lot of people do, I, I you know. But unfortunately, it's it's not. It, it's a very good tool, and especially in situations where uh, accessibility is a problem. But again, like Rania pointed out, you know, the obvious obvious that people that you're talking to, and especially if you're communicating with activists and whatnot, I mean, there is a bias that you have to be cognizant of. And so you have to be careful about where you get your information. Uh, you, if you're using social media to communicate with people, you don't know who's on the other end a lot of times. Um, you know, they can say who, you know, they can say they're someone, but they might be someone else. And so that's not, unfortunately, that's been a very gut, like large force in what journalism has become. Um, and it, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, nothing can substitute face-to-face -face interaction, ground reporting. That, you know, that is not 100 years ago and today. It's the same situation, the same outcome, the same result. Uh, and when you try to substitute that, then the business suffers, and that's just the way it is. Anybody else want to jump in on this? Okay. Uh, I'll give you the answer, Bob. Journalism is not a profession. No, it's not. We know what the professions are. That they are military, religion, medicine, law, and academia. They have rules. They are internally governed. They have high barriers to entry. Journalism has none of these things for a good reason. It's a much more democratic thing. It's a craft. And it's best learned in the field and best done in the field. But to think that this profession is to just go down the totally wrong street, and to think that you go to Columbia Law Journalism School makes you a reporter. No, it makes you somebody who has one more useless Ivy League degree. <laughs> Question, um, we'll go to, uh, first, for, yeah, first you and then you. So uh, I'm Jim McCormick, I don't have an affiliation here, but uh, uh, we just listened to Eric Toller tell us about the power of open source. He spent 18 months and pulled out a few very interesting facts. How does that apply to, to your day-to-day -day life? Does that scale? Is it even at all practical to what you do? I'm sorry, I was so busy doing microphone direction, I didn't catch the question. I was curious how the story that Eric Toller just gave us about uh, tracking down open source uh, some some very relevant information, uh, but the, the scale of information that he got and the effort it took to get to it, um, I'm just curious if that has any practical place in reporting on hard to get areas, even if we do overcome the, uh, the constraints on the communication, those little tidbits of biased or in, unintended information 
information, whether it's over a phone call or a, a photograph that's inadvertently posted on the internet, is, it, is there a point where we'll be able to tap into that information and recover the ground that we've lost in these areas? Sharon, that sounds like one made perfectly for you. Maybe. I mean, open source is like anything. It's a source of information. There's bias in that. Um, it's, you know, I think there's been great reporting that's been done from open source, but it's not, it's not the end all be all. I think there's been a lot of mistakes in open source reporting, and it's the same thing probably true in the intelligence community, and it's the same thing true in journalism. Um, I, I, I don't know that journalism is a, um, Maybe it's not a traditional profession, but it has developed over the decades certain ethics, certain barriers to entry. So I, I actually kind of disagree with what you said. It is a profession self-defined, perhaps, um, and open source. If we're a profession, it'd get paid <laughs> because you'd be able to lobby and control the market. Does anybody here from MIT who's worked in the Middle East have a question? An associate professor of political science at MIT. I spent some time in the Idlib countryside in late 2012 when it was still accessible. This is a question for Abdelaziz. I'm just curious to know about the other narrative, the ISIS narrative, and the, wh whether you saw their type of journalism on the ground and uh, to what degree there was any collusion with Syrian citizens supporting them, and uh, how do you still get your information now that you're out um, and not close? So first, I talk about the information, how we get it out. So as I told you that uh, ISIS closed all the internet cafe shop, then they let for to work, and they separate cameras, checkpoints, all that thing. They don't want any activists, anyone to do any media work inside the city. They want only their media office to spread their ideology. So it's so hard to work over there, so we found our own way. The good thing that we are, all of us we are from this city, so we know every meter. So we, and sometimes we knew how to get some information from ISIS in some ways. So we knew about all that rules before they did it. So we found a way to, tran to transfer information. So we found three ways. Until now, the first way is still working. And we have other two ways. So even if they will cut the internet, we have ways to transfer information. It's so hard because it's not, e it's so hard to transfer the information, videos, photos, because this way it's really so hard. So, and the access to transfer or to send it, it's also too, not that easy. And at the same time, the encrypt, encryption stuff, it's so important. So it took a time to develop our own applications to transfer the information. Okay, our panel members will be around if you want to follow up and buttonhole them. Please join me in thanking our panel of craftsmen. Thank you very much. <laughs>